Hello and welcome to Myth Makers. Myth Makers is the podcast for fantasy fans and fantasy creatives brought to you by the Oxford Centre for Fantasy. And today I'm joined by Squire Rushnell and Louise Duarte Rushnell, who are friends of our centre and are just about to have a film that they have been collaborating on with Netflix released in the middle of March. And this is a film about a very special dog. So in their honour, and while we talk about filmmaking, we're going to have a general theme about dogs in fiction and dogs in real life. So first of all, uh, Squire and Louise, perhaps you'd like to um, tell us a little little bit about yourself and how you came to make this film. Well, that's wonderful, Julia. So wonderful to be with you. Um, well, the our backgrounds are in the entertainment business um, all of our lives. And I was at ABC for 20 years, and 15 of those were in children's television. Oh. So I did a lot of fantasy work <laughs> and, uh, and a lot of dogs that talk, you know. So uh, it, it is not unusual for us to be in the dog movie making business. What we um, have done is... Uh, we have been producing a series of books about Godwinks, which are those little coincidences that we say are not coincidence. And so what has that got to do with dogs? Well, we decided that we would do uh, a book about Godwink stories, all true stories about amazing uh, 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 situations, w- always with a dog at the center of the story. And that's a dog wink. And so when we uh, presented this to Netflix, they started crying and we started telling them about more of the uh, uh, true stories that we have in our Dog Wink book. And uh, and when we got to Ruby, they said, let's do that. And so that's how that all kind of evolved. I'm going to build the suspense here because, you know, that's one of the good uh, rules of storytelling. If you don't tell everybody up front exactly how great Ruby is, you've got to carry on All listening. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we're going to reach the wonderful Ruby in a minute. But I think just the theme of dogs got me thinking about how we write about dogs. We all know that thanks to the pandemic, a lot of people went out and got themselves pets, didn't they? Yeah, and they uh, if, if they didn't have a dog before, many more people do now. I'm I'm a dog owner. I've got two. Have you got dogs? We had dogs. We don't have a dog at the moment. Uh, yeah. But then you have the experience of what, the thing about a dog, unlike a cat, which is always feels as though you're its servant. A dog is definitely, you know, all the cliches about a man's best friend or a woman's best friend are true about them. They are characters in the house and very much part of a family as, as much as a dog can be. So mm-hmm. when you turn to looking at dogs in fiction, I think some of those qualities carry across, don't don't they? So when you were growing up, what were the main sort of fictional products about dogs that you were watching or reading or how have they appeared in your um, story so far? Well, when Squire was at ABC, he did develop a show called Scooby-Doo, which is yeah. one of those wonderful mm-hmm. fantasy dogs. And Scooby was... <laughs> Now, come on, everybody. That was worth tuning in for just to hear that snippet. I, I did not know that. You mentioned Scooby-Doo when we were chatting before, but I now need to take my hat off to you because that's definitely probably my favorite cartoon dog right there. So tell us more about Scooby. Well, I think that uh, along the line of where you were going, that, that in fantasy dogs that come alive, when you 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 start thinking about well what would a per- certain dog sound like mm-hmm. what would dog say what would a dog think about and so on and so forth and so uh, in our jobs uh, in building fantasy cartoon characters you know a dog like Scooby is um, it's it's building the character and so. Uh, every wonderful story has rich characters. You you kind of know what those characters are all about right from the beginning, and hopefully you fall in love with them. And so Scooby is just an oversized dog <laughs> who's afraid of his own shadow, and he happens to be working with a, a group of kids who happen to be on ghost hunts all the time. So Scooby is always <laughs> afraid. And... Um, 
I can remember one day when I was uh, visiting a friend of mine, Dr. Joe Barbera, who Hannah Barbera were the cartoon makers who who uh, created Scooby. And and I said, Joe, I think we ought to have a new character to Scooby Doo. And so we were paddling around his pool in Palm Springs in a big Yogi Bear kind of uh, inner tubes, uh, paddling <laughs> along. And there were all of these. Uh, uh, big shrubs around us. And we could just imagine that the little old ladies next door on either <laughs> side were listening into this conversation of two grown men as we were talking about creating a new character. And I said, you know, the character I always loved was the Tasmanian devil. And so he was very small, but he was afraid of nothing. And so Joe, because that would be the offset to, to Scooby. So Joe says, yeah, I've been thinking about that. We'll have a, a nephew by the name of Scrappy, Scrappy-Doo. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so here we are having this conversation. Well, what would he, how, how would he react? Well, well uh, 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 Scooby would be in a place where he's frightened and he's jumped up into the chandelier and the chandelier is moving in it, shaking. And in comes little Scrappy-Doo. Hello, Uncle Scoob. Good idea. You be up there so you can jump on the bad guy. So Scooby always saw his uncle as a hero and never saw any faults whatsoever. And so that is how the evolution of, uh, of those little dogs came about. I think one of the lovely things about Scooby, uh, Scooby Doo Senior, is that yeah. in a way I think he gives a child, the child probably emotes or re relates most to him and Shaggy. They're like fragments of part of what it's like to be a child. So you can be scared as Sto Scooby. And I suppose maybe what Scrappy do is it presents a possibility of the brave self, doesn't it? Yes. You know, Absolutely. I, I think there's some psychology psychologist out there who's done a <laughs> you know, uh, the, the kids and um, Scrappy and Scooby are probably the entire human psyche right there, probably. <laughs> I should think so. Yeah. I'm sure that's right. It's a thesis somewhere. So um, working in cartoon, obviously, you don't have the, the problem of um, working with real animals uh, because you can draw whatever you like. You can be eating a huge sandwich or swinging from the chandelier. No, no problem at all. But um of course, some of the fiction about dogs that I remember most are ones which involved real dogs in films. And two that came to mind when I was thinking about that is, of course, we have to mention Lassie. Mm. You know, Little Jimmy's down the well. I mean, Saturday mornings <laughs> in the 70s seem to be Lassie time in my memory. Yeah. Um, and then more recently, the sort of standout trained dog appearing in a, a film I remember is the very interesting um, film called The Artist about the golden age of cinema in the black and white. And I think mm -hmm. the dog was called Uggy and was almost mm -hmm. got an Oscar for it, I think. Mm -hmm. So can you, when you think back to watching television or, or films, is there any other dogs that you can remember that sort of influenced your relationship to how dogs are portrayed on film? Well, we always love Rin Tin Tin. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. If, did you have Rin Chin Chin? And of course, no. Old Yeller. Old Yeller was one of my favorites. Of course, you know my. We didn't like the. Ending we didn't like the that. ending, and it's it's interesting because um, I have two sons that just love their dogs. One of my youngest son actually has five dogs that uh, he got from a shelter. And he and his wife, whenever they're looking at a dog movie, they go online to make sure. I think it's called. Did the dog die or something? <laughs> and if the dog dies, they don't. No, go going. <laughs> they were wounded by old Yeller. They were wounded, yeah. But so, and we don't like that either. And yeah. and uh, we'll talk about Ruby in a minute. But there, there was a point at the beginning of the film where it did not look promising for yeah. Ruby. Yeah. And so a lot of people say, just please, please tell me to. Does Ruby live? <laughs> yeah, you need to get your listing on does the dog die correct or else you'll, yes, you know, yes, the audience right. will drop away. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> before we come to Ruby, I told you I was building the suspense because she's such a wonderful yeah. story about her. Um, there's a couple of other honourable mentions that need to happen now, I think, which um, I'm thinking of S Snoopy. Oh, yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. And yeah. Snoopy, I think, is an interesting one in that Snoopy isn't the sort of um, lovable family dog. S Snoopy is the ironic commentator version. Yeah. It's quite a cat-like yeah. presence, I think, in Snoopy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. We love Snoopy. But, but Snoopy, you notice, doesn't live in the house. He True. has to stay outside right. in the dog house. The dog house. The yard dog, yeah. But but uh, you always think that uh, Charles Schultz, the cartoonist, that that Snoopy was a lot of his personality. Mm -hmm. Charlie Brown obviously was a, <laughs> a big part of his personality. But Snoopy yeah. was uh, was the wise voice yeah. very often, and yeah. and it's isn't it wonderful how we how we can take these animals and. Yeah give them a wisdom that maybe we don't have and, and give them uh, an ability to observe things that we just don't mm -hmm. uh, think about. Now, I, I think I remember you always talking about dogs when you'd, and, and when you'd see them and you'd start because you always did voices mm -hmm. for a living. She did voices for cartoon characters mm -hmm. and other characters. Mm -hmm. And as an impressionist, all of her adult life. Uh, so, you would look at a dog and and start to wonder what, what, we, what he would sound what, what, what like. What he would sound yeah, like. It, de oh. it depends. Yeah, every dog has their own personality. And every, every animal actually has their own personality. We would look at that. You know, there is a fascinating story and how animals can actually save someone's life. Fantasy animals like Bugs Bunny. Oh. But this is the most fascinating story about bugs. Well... Can I tell you that story about Bugs Bunny? Because yeah, uh, he's Bugs not strictly a dog, but we'll allow Bugs Bunny to sort of yeah. edge in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bugs, Bugs Bunny is, is we're, we're talking about the classics here now. Bugs Bunny was the voice creation, was was created, the voice of Bugs Bunny was created by Mel Blanc. And he did all of the Warner Brothers uh, voice characters from Porky Pig to, mm -hmm. uh, what, Suffer and Deputy Suck Dog. Yeah. He did Deputy Dog, too. And, and Suffer, Suffer and Suck Succotash. Well, you got to do the voice. Right? Suffer and Succotash. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so uh, Bugs Bunny was probably the most famous character that, that Mel Blanc ever did. Mel Blanc was in a terrible, terrible accident. <clears throat> automobile accident every bone in his body with the exception of i think one arm or something like that was broken and he was in a in in this mummified uh kind of condition in a coma and um the doctors were worried that if he didn't come out of this coma his, he would have brain damage weeks had gone by and the doctors would would uh, just plead with the family to just stay there and keep talking to to Mel Blanc. One day the doctor came in and he was obviously worried. Weeks had gone by and he came into the room making his morning rounds. And at the moment that he was about to take a look at Mel Blanc, this staid and rather uh, serious doctor, noticed that on the screen... Bugs Bunny had just appeared on the TV in the room. And so he's hearing beep, beep, all those cartoon noises. And, and so uh, the doctor, a little bit out of character, says, well, good morning, Bugs. How are you today? And for the first time, Mel Blank spoke as Bugs Bunny. Ah, what's up, Doc? You know, and so cracking a joke uh, as he comes out of a coma. That's yeah, and and so uh, it was later uh, explained to me by neurologists that uh, that different parts of the brain respond to different cues, and Mel Blanc was always uh, you know listening to cues from the director. Okay, what about you, Bugs? What about you, Porky? What about you, uh, Sufferance? Elmer Fudd, <laughs> Elmer Fudd, or any one of those, and so. Uh, that at that moment, the doctor was like the director. Giving and even command. though even though Mel Blanc could not speak, Bugs Bunny was in a part of the brain, was in a little piece of his brain that did work. Mm -hmm. And so the doctor then said, well, how are you, Porky? Are you in there? And so Porky Pig mm -hmm. started to talk. And, and that is how Bugs Bunny, this fantasy character, helped save Mel Blanc's life and mm -hmm. bring him out of that coma. Mm -hmm. It went on for another 30 years of doing cartoon voices. 
Oh, well, I, it's definitely, uh, that, there's a film in there as well, Squire. Just, you know, <laughs> if you're looking for a film, another, another film project. <laughs> All yeah. right. Um, so I, th that's talking, you know, with voices and, and Louise, you know, hats off to you now for doing all those different voices because that is a, a skill I definitely don't have and wish I did have um <laughs> but I've also thought there is quite a number of dogs who are very expressive but don't speak and the two that came to mind um because we're in Europe over here is Snowy from Tintin mm -hmm. who is uh, obviously as intelligent as Tintin they're they're the Sherlock and Watson of you know Belgium um and also Wallace and Gromit. Now, that they're the Ardman animation um, mm. uh, variations. I think you've probably seen some of those films. But if you look at Gromit, it's just his eyebrows or the sort of, not even mm. eyebrows. It's just uh, his eyes animate and that's his, that's, he doesn't need to say anything because mm. he has such a range of very subtle mm -hmm. um, commentary upon poor old Gromit. Mm. So... We de definitely use dogs as a kind of reflection back on us, don't we? And, and a commentator yeah. on our society and what we're doing with it. Mm -hmm. um, I've got to mention Pluto. Oh, Otherwise, no. I'm going to get <laughs> messages from people saying, you forgot Pluto. I haven't forgotten. Uh, oh, yeah. Or is Pluto. Yeah, Lady in the Tramp. We love Lady in the Tramp, too, didn't yes, we? Yes, we did. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a classic. But the um, I think everyone thinks first of the, uh, the, the scene where they're falling in love with the... Yes. Spaghetti. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Who could forget? It's classic. Yeah. I think I prefer Lady in the Tramp to Pluto somehow. I think that they, they, they've got more um, Pluto, I think, because he's, for me, he's lost within the ensemble mm -hmm. uh, Lady the, of, you know, Mickey Mouse and everybody. Um, yeah, no, Lady in the Tramp is definitely very fondly remembered from my childhood. So, okay, I'm now going to introduce a real hero. We've been talking about fictional dogs. Mm -hmm. So let's have a real hero and tell us about Ruby. So you mentioned at the beginning that you came across her story and in a whole series of books about sort of the dog wink idea of these wonderful, wonderful um, coincidences that happen. Mm -hmm. Tell us about Ruby. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you, you came up with the idea. Well, what happened was we were... Um, we do the Godwink series of books. So there's 12 books in the series. And, and one day I just had this thought that was just such a strong feeling. I said to Squire, I think we should do a book about dogs. And he said, well, what, what are we going to do with the dog? Well, we did the Godwink books. And then Squire said, well, what if we did a book called Dog Winks and we do Godwinks, but, you know, these supernatural occurrences that happen only with dogs in the center of the story. So we thought, okay, that's that's good, but where are we going to get these dog stories? And the very next day, on my Facebook, here pops God up Winkers, a God, God called Winker God Winkers, mm -hmm. and what pops up? But a woman writes, "Hey, did you guys see this incredible story about a canine officer in Providence, Rhode Island, and this shelter dog named Ruby? And it's in the Providence Journal. You should read it." So we read it, and Squire said, "Oh my gosh." That's not only the first story for the book, but that's a movie. <laughs> and so he went on then to call the principles of the story. And one thing led to another. And then the NBC Today show, Squire was talking about it there. And then that's how the whole Netflix thing evolved. And next thing you know, March 17th, we have a movie called Rescued by Ruby. But it's a yeah. remarkable, it really is a supernatural story. Yeah. And you know... Um, as there are 20 stories in the book, Dog Winks, but uh, as we were writing them, uh, I was feeling that we needed to have the dog's voice mm -hmm. because here we are telling the story about people, but uh, what about the dog? I mean, the dog is the center of the story, but we're not hearing the dog's voice. And so uh, as we went through each one of those 20 stories, we put in thought, uh, like thought balloons in the book, thoughts of the dog, what they might be thinking at that particular moment, what their point of view was at that particular moment, so that we were representing them, even though they were laying under the table at the time, they certainly had an observation and they could see things that helped move the story along. And um, 
And so I think that that was part of the evolution of Ruby um, in terms of uh, the, the joy of seeing that character evolve. Ruby is a, um, just in, a, in, a, in a, a nutshell, it is a story about a Rhode Island state police uh, officer who grew up with ADHD. You know, he was, uh, 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 he had deficit uh, uh, disorders and hyperactivity and so forth. And so uh, he always had to work harder in school. He had to try harder to be in sports. In that police academy, he had to work 10 times harder than anybody else. And so he always thought in the back of his mind that if he could, if he could be like a dog, they have an a supernatural power of being able to smell, uh, uh, being able to, sm uh, they had a, that, uh, an ability to, to pick up scents that was a kind of a superhero uh, 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 power. And he thought that if he could be associated with a dog, that that would take care of his deficits and his uh, deficiencies. And so that's why he always wanted to be in the, in the canine corps. But, because he was ADD, he, he just couldn't get through. In the meantime, he finally was about to get the chance to be in the canine corps, and the budget was cut. Because they buy these dogs from the Ukraine that cost ten dollars or $15,000 that are bred for police work. And so uh, he is then through incredible God winks, dog winks, he is connected in real life with a rescue dog who is also ADD. <laughs> and that's the dog named Ruby. Ruby has been rejected by five families about to be euthanized because nipping was on the on the record just uh, just before they had to make that decision with the help of the lawyers, of course. And so uh, when Officer Dan is paired with Ruby at the last minute, and that is the, the nucleus of their relationship. It is a long path of six months trying to train Ruby. But Ruby rises to the occasion eventually and becomes the number one dog in the canine unit. And then I'm not going to tell you the end of the movie because there is an amazing God wink at the end that will just blow everybody's mind. Mm -hmm. And it's 100% true. This movie really captures the true story. Everything about it is true except for one character. And we'll let you guess who that is mm -hmm. too when you see it on Netflix. Now, I, I happen to have had a little bit of forewarning about what, what the twist might be. And I just want to say to the people out there that it is one of those twists, which if you're a writer, a script writer, you would think up for fiction. Yeah. And you know that thing about fact is stranger than fiction that is definitely, definitely. the true here so um yeah definitely watch that and find out can i just ask not not because i have a dog who doesn't always come back when called would i also pick up training tips whilst watching this movie oh. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you got to add that to your fact, publicity. <laughs> yeah, as a matter of fact our writer uh, in the beginning, had too much training in it, oh, way too much training. And so we kept saying, pair it back, pair it back, pair it back. We don't want to go to school, uh, you know. I mean, this is not a college degree and how to train your dog. But it is now the perfect balance yes. of training. And people will learn mm -hmm. a lot of things about training their dogs mm -hmm. by watching Rescued by Ruby <laughs> starting March 17th on yeah. Netflix. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've got that. <laughs> In the calendar, I've watched. The, I put a link to the trailer in the show notes as well, so people can can watch Great. it. Oh, um, good. So th that's a true story, which is phenomenal in itself. But there's another layer of story here, isn't there? Mm, which yeah. is about working with real animals. Uh, I was actually at this weekend just reading. Um, in, I think it was in the Times newspaper over here that because there's a lot of content being made over in the UK at the moment, people who supply animals for um, television and film are, are completely inundated with requests for mm -hmm. dogs and owls and I don't know cats, any any anything that appears in your favorite 
show and quite often that is a dog so huge demand for star dogs and stunt dogs and so on how did you find your ruby because the ruby in the film isn't the real ruby presumably because uh, real ruby is either up you know in the farm upstate or um no ruby's still working still oh on the my police goodness board. yes ruby. yeah, ruby's okay. 11 and Ruby is Australian Shepherd Border Collie Mix, mm -hmm. which uh, both of them are very, very smart. Mm -hmm. Both of them are highly active. Mm -hmm. and um, But that's that's one of the secrets as to Ruby's uh, finding her purpose in life. Mm -hmm. but, um, but Ruby, you know, as with any uh, Hollywood film, usually when they portray a real character, the actor or actress is a lot more, shall we say... A little prettier. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. More handsome. Yes. 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 So, so uh, the the dog that plays Ruby is beautiful, and the dog really looks like Lassie. But here's here's the story. It was so parallel. This dog named Bear was found on the streets in Oklahoma, very much like Ruby. They brought it to a shelter, and the days looked like they were numbered for Bear and our trainers. Who we had asked them, we said, could you possibly get a shelter dog to play a shelter dog? And they said, well, that's not going to be easy, but, you know, we'll, we'll look. And they found this dog, Bear, at a shelter with basically the same kind of ending that mm. Ruby would have had if Ruby wasn't saved. And that's a whole other thing that we won't mm. talk about because that's part of the surprise at the end. But what happened was they took a bear and then as they were leaving with bear the shelter said you have to take shiloh this is bear's best friend they've been together in the shelter and they'll just be heartbroken if you don't take shiloh too so they did now shiloh is the stand-in basically for bear so when in you the see movie them, so they did a whole makeover on shiloh to look <laughs> just like ruby which is bear and Shiloh does, does a lot of the jumping and the leaping and the running. And so uh, it, it's just, and it's an amazing story how this dog was saved just like Ruby was. Yeah. It's just, a, it's, it just yeah. gets and, better and better. And I never knew this. Uh, well, bear is a male name. Mm -hmm. Bear is a male dog yes. who plays uh, Ruby, mm -hmm. which is a, a girl dog. Mm -hmm. And I never knew that Lassie was played by a male dog. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. It's all, all my illusions were shattered. <laughs> <laughs> Always. All the Lassies, because there were more than, there was more than one. Uh, uh, all the Lassies were played by uh, male dogs. Yeah. 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 Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Uh, so... Uh, anyway, we just we we, yeah. we we had so much fun making this film, and everyone loved these dogs so much. I, I would I want to be that dog. I want to be Ruby. <laughs> I really do because <laughs> Ruby gets treated great. <laughs> so is um, Bear still working as a um, a film dog now? Has it is this begun a career, or is Bear now uh, living with the trainer? Happening. Living with the trainers, yeah, yeah. And and I'm sure. I'm sure Bear will have more um, screen appearances. I yes. think they this had is really an amazing. Yeah, dog. I think I think Bear almost had to live with the trainers because the trainers had to teach Bear to be very naughty, had to tear up couches, you know, and, yeah. <laughs> and to oh, nice. do all sorts of things yeah. and dig holes in lawns and everything. So. Yeah. So I can't imagine. <laughs> you wonder if that is psychologically damaging to bear. <laughs> you know, uh, we saw the uh, the movie that is out now called Dog. Yes, which we're, we're not raving about because we're happy, happy dog, happy movie people. Yeah. You know, and that that's a bit on the dark side for us. But it's a war dog, mm -hmm. and you think about dogs that are used for for police work mm -hmm. and war. I mean, they're doing their job, mm -hmm. but they they become psychologically, um, you know, damaged because of their work. You uh, wonder, yeah. yeah. But I, I think they they know how to undo it all. <laughs> I think the trainers, the trainers do, yeah. Because well, we would hopefully. they would yeah, it would be true. so funny because we would see some of the scenes and you don't hear of the trainers, but. Uh, they'd say, dig it, dig it, dig it, dig it, dig it, dig it, you know, and, and As you the see, dog is digging the, up the wall. Dig it, dig it, dig it, dig it, dig it, and you see the dog 
digging up the lung. Good, good dog. Dig it, dig it, dig it. So I wouldn't think that would so be. How do you undo that? How do you undo that? I don't yeah. know. Well, this this is the next film, isn't it? And that that's where all the dog. That's why all dog owners will be tuning in uh, to oh, find out how yeah. to undo bad habits. I would have <laughs> thought that they probably work really hard on cues. <laughs> which don't you know um which don't exist in in ordinary life or else the trainer would be perpetually living in a house that is you know wrecked <laughs> <That's right. laughs> which can't be acceptable so rescued by ruby is a most fantastic story um and i'm sure everyone would really enjoy meeting this incredible dog and i'm actually even more impressed to find that ruby could not be pulled away from her day job to become a film star. I think that has added an extra layer for me of pleasure, thinking mm. that she's out there working uh, as we speak. Um, we always have as a tradition on these podcasts to pick where in all the fantasy world is the best place to be something or you know, where's the best river, where's the best mm. inn, that kind of thing. And in your honour, uh, in the honour of Ruby and uh, Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo, we will have to choose where is the best place to be a dog. Mm. Now, just to give you the sort of lie of the land, you can choose any sort of fantasy world. It can be the worlds of myths and legends. So, you know, it, it could be Cerberus at the gates of, um, Hades, you know, Hades or uh, one of the, you know, one of those mythic dogs, or it could be... Mm a cartoon it really doesn't matter the choice is yours what are you going to choose well you know i would want to be um one of queen elizabeth's dogs one of the gorkies Ooh. i would love that yeah. to live in the palace and to go and she's she's always taking the dogs for a walkie you know mm. I'd, I'd love to i'd love to that, be that's there. real life so you have to you have to choose a fictional version of that <laughs> but okay. there's plenty of fictional versions of the queen that you can choose so <laughs> In, in the crown, it's a fantasy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I yeah. don't know. Uh, well, I think after watching uh, Ruby and the the, <laughs> the, 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 the big attraction yes. for Ruby was raw hot dogs. So I would say the best place is in a hot dog factory. I don't think there's any question about that. That's where Ruby would want to be. <laughs> Probably not good for, for her, her health, though. <laughs> we have a lot of people who listen to this who are Tolkien fans and I should just do an honorable mention to one of the, Tolkien has two Tolkien dogs that I could um remember mm -hmm. one is a dog called Juan or H U A N who appears in the Silmarillion and he plays a wonderful part in the story of Beren and Luthien which is one of the central love stories that Tolkien made up but he does have a heroic but tragic end. So I wouldn't mm. recommend being a dog in um, in mm. the first age of Tolkien's Middle Earth. Mm. And then his other dog is one in his uh, story called The Farmer Giles of Ham, where it's a farmer's dog. Mm -hmm. who, and that story involves a, the arrival of a dragon into the area. It's like a comic story of a medieval setting. So that dog gets quite a good deal as well. But actually, you know what? I think the best place to be a dog is the is right under our noses. It's Scooby-Doo. <laughs> I mean, you, you get your hot dogs, Squire, don't you? Yeah. Plenty of them, and Scooby Snacks. And you get to ride around with your friends in a mystery machine. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So to be honest, what's not yeah. like? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, and 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 Ruby Ruby didn't have to have much uh, uh, didn't have to learn much language. Scooby, Scooby, Scooby Doo. Scooby -Doo. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. what else did you have to know about Scooby? That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody I, can talk like Scooby. <laughs> so I think that that is the best fantasy world, the world of um, Scooby. <laughs> Thank you so I'll much go. um, for joining us to talk about uh, dogs in fantasy and in real life. I think you know. Um, it's even more exciting when you find something that feels like fantasy but actually turns out to be true. And we wish you all the best with your film when it comes out in March the 17th. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you so you, much. Julia. Thanks for listening to Mythmakers Podcast, brought to you by the Oxford Centre for Fantasy. Visit OxfordCentreForFantasy.org to join in the fun. Find out about our online courses, in-person stays in Oxford, 
Plus, visit our shop for great gifts. Tell a friend and subscribe wherever you find your favorite podcasts worldwide. Mm -hmm.